I'm Melissa Idris. Welcome to Consider This. This is the show where we want you to consider and then reconsider what you know of the news of the day. In today's episode, we'll delve into the increasingly complex terrain of higher education as it grapples with the integration of generative AI. Now, while some universities are eagerly embracing the promise of AI, Others remain apprehensive, grappling with concerns of, over academic integrity and the erosion of traditional pedagogical methods. So joining me on the show today to discuss the rise of AI in academia, I have two guests tonight. Dr. Um, Professor Mushta Al-Atabi, who is a chairman of the Vice Chancellor's Council for Private Universities, as well as the Provost and CEO of Harriet Watt University, Malaysia, as well as Dr. Melissa Maria Mahmoud, who is Dean of Sunri University's School of Education and Head of the Department of Professional and Continuing Education. Both of you, welcome. Thank you so much for joining me on the show today. An exciting us. topic. And I want to get the lay of the land in academia um, to begin our conversation. Where do you see, both of you see the uh, conversation surrounding AI, generative AI, in higher education positioned today? I mean, what, wh how are universities um, responding to it, broadly speaking? Can I get you to begin, uh, Mushta? Yeah, sure, of course. Uh, I think the conversation is evolving, and the conversation starts with plagiarism, uh -huh. preventing plagiarism, and, and, and things like that. Uh, but I think it, uh, it is increasingly moving into other domains. I'll give you an example. Um, I was speaking to one of our students and I said, what do you use ChatGPT for? Mm. He said, when I don't understand something from my lecturers, I go to ChatGPT and say, explain this to me as if I were five years old. Oh, wow. <laughs> so that's an interesting way. Now, why this is an interesting thing? Because many of the academics in, around the world, if you ask them, why did you join academia? They will tell you, I like to share my knowledge. And I really think that notion of us being the owners of the knowledge that we are sharing with others is being sort of threatened. Mm. And I think that would require that we reinvent ourselves. So what is the value that we add to our students? So that, that there, are, there are these elements that are taking place as well. Okay, I, I can see that shift in conversation where it started with plagiarism, but it, it feels quite scary knowing that we're kind of on the cusp of a disruption, of a disruptive technology. Um, Dr. Melissa, where do you see the conversations around AI on campus and outside of campus? I do think that um, generative AI, it is unprecedented potential. It has created and contributed to this abundance of efficiency. Mm. Uh, let me give you an example. Um, for example, in terms of grading, now we can automate that. Mm. And in terms of creating of syllabus or curriculum, we can also automate that. And I think from the student perspective, um, it has created an avenue for students to be within a space where they can personalize their learning experience. And um, I think with regards to the conversation where we are at now, um, it is important to acknowledge the potential, but at the same time, okay, they are, um, you know, these are opportunities, right, Melissa? Mm. But at the same time, they are um, these challenges. Mm. And I believe that these challenges can be addressed quite simply by having conversations. Okay, be before we get there, let's lay out what are the challenges. So you, you talked about some of the positives, the opportunities, right? You talked about automated um, grading and personalized curriculum. Where are the challenges in your view? I do think, um, just to pick up on uh, Prof Mushtaq, um, you know, point where he did mention a little bit about you know plagiarism. Mm -hmm. So the the, the 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 issue on you know integrity and ethics um, can be. Um, we need to first create awareness rather than putting a halt and a stop or even a pause. Mm -hmm. Let's you know create this, um, you know environment where not just uh, students but even you know administrative staff at the university can be part of the conversation and at the same time okay um, contribute to what they think would be the most beneficial for them mm. okay Mushta, what about you what do you, where do you think the negative impacts the risks could lie there's something that we need to recognize 
that AI is not just a tool. I know many people say, oh, this is just a tool, just another technology. This is a very different technology. This is the first time in our entire history as a human species where we've created a technology that has the potential of improving itself, mm -hmm. making decisions, uh, reacting and responding in, a, in an unprecedented way. So think of the, a nuclear bomb. Mm -hmm. The nuclear bomb is, is an amazing sort of complex technology to, to figure out. But this technology still needs a human being to say, you know, put a bomb on a plane and go and, and, and use it in that way. So it wouldn't be used without a human sort of uh, uh, influence. Mm -hmm. Currently, if you look at AI, even the makers of AI cannot tell you <laughs> how AI is producing what it's producing. Mm -hmm. I, I, I've been looking at and testing actually some uh, uh, AI detection tools. It's called uh, uh, GPT-0. So mm -hmm. you take anything mm -hmm. from AI, put in GPT-0, it would tell you whether this is from AI or human, right? right? Mm -hmm. And I ask experts in AI, I say, how did it do it? Because it's so accurate. They say, we have no clue. What we do, we give it, uh, text after text after text, and then it figures it out on its own, and we don't know how does it do it. So I think this is, this is the, the essence mm. of the challenge, not only for education or higher education, but for the society. And I think the, uh, the, the conversation, in my view, needs to evolve quickly from just helping each other, because, you know, just to share a, a little story, uh, someone wrote to our vice chancellor and said, I've created this tool that could do all the marking on behalf of your, your, your staff. As you could tell, I'm, I talk about AI all the time, so the <laughs> vice chancellor forwarded it to me. And I actually said, my biggest worry is that we get a tool to do the marking, our students use AI to produce the material mm. to be marked, mm. and then AI produce the, the material, the reports or the thesis or whatever. We uh, use AI to market, and there is no learning that took place, mm, I think. Yeah. So ultimately, uh, to my mind, I think AI can be used by people when they are motivated to learn so that they learn. And if there is lack of motivation, then people will just use it to do you know, shortcuts. I, I, I see now job applications, and they have brilliant covering letters yep. and I put that in the detection and that's AI and you know this is not a good thing for the person who produced an AI, a, a, a covering letter with AI because I, I want to know your English but, your, your level of but English. But why is it not a good thing for, for the, sure. per, the applicant yes. um, for them it is a tool that will help level the playing field for them will close whatever bridges inequalities that they may have education. So let me yeah. tell you, let me tell you. So if I would like to appoint this person to be uh, someone who gives a great speech and based on what they have given me, they have brilliant English. So mm -hmm. English is a requirement. Mm -hmm. Now when I come to interview you and then your English is broken, you don't have, so, so I think even when you use it to improve your communication, in my view, I tell my, the people around me, I said, look, put it there and learn from it so that you improve. Now the issue is, if you use this as a, as, as crutches, mm. then you will forever be dependent on it. Okay, yeah. Let, let's talk about how teaching, learning, and assessments have to change in the age of yep. AI and academia. Mm. Let's talk. Because um, the beginning of this conversation, we talked about plagiarism, yeah. and I think that's the crux of everything. The idea that um, students will use this in their coursework, they won't be learning, uh, it's considered plagiarism, <coughs> and then uh, faculty will use it to grade and all of that. <laughs> yeah. How do we think about how teaching and learning and assessments. Assessments need to change. Is there a place for AI in coursework, for instance? Dr. Melissa, what do you think? I do think definitely there's a, there's a place mm. for, uh, for AI. Um, but uh, just to pick up on what you mentioned earlier, it is important for us to reimagine and redesign the mm. way we look into assessment. Mm. Because um, again, we can't use um, AI as the main tool if it were to be a a, a crutch, then you know the the absence of AI tool would then, you know, everything will fall apart. Yeah, yeah. right. If you're using AI to generate your assessments, your yes. assignments, all of that, it's so it, it is a good opportunity now for academics, you know, within the space of edu higher education, to look into how we redesign the assessment to ensure that 
this tool is just a supplementary rather than the, the, the tool which would then solve all the world's problems. Mm -hmm. Because we need to remember when you become too reliant on specific things, it dimi diminishes critical thinking, which I think could be one of the crux of the problem, you know, especially when, when, when everything is based on AI. And the thing about AI, we have to remember, we train all this tool. And it, it, it can't be evidently proven that whatever being generated by, for example, ChatGPT, you know, can be inherently biased. Mm, yes. Yeah? So we need to be really cautious, you know, with what being generated. We need to create this, not just awareness, and this is the opportunity where we can look into the syllabus, where AI can be one of the um, important, you know, not to say cost, but something that we we, we talk about, mm. again, conversation, again, awareness, again, the way we look into how we approach AI and how we can, we can, we can in a way, welcome AI as part of the teaching and learning, as part of how we you know, deliver you know, our courses and subjects. How do we get to that point where we're no longer just um, running um, students' assignments through an AI detector and then seeing how many percent AI it is yeah. and using that as a benchmark for plagiarism, for yeah. instance. How do we get beyond that and think about assessing the critical thinking and learning of, um, of university students and in the age of AI with AI as a supplementary tool? So let, let me tell you a, yeah. my, my personal vision. So interestingly, MQA has this staff student ratio of 1 to 20 as a good ratio okay. so yes. for every lecturer you have you have 20 students okay. so that's fantastic now if you look at our academic staff now they spend so much of their time marking doing administrative right. work and so on now imagine if you could that all that administrative work or most of it is done by ai mm -hmm. yeah and imagine if we actually tell people that this is done by ai mm -hmm. but then the academic staff will spend like 90% of their time with these 20 students. They will need to know them by name, and the assessment becomes, sure, you use AI to learn about any topic, to balancing the accounts, designing heat exchanger, whatever that might be, <laughs> but then the assessment will become, come and present this work yep. in this group, and let's talk about it. Let's bring people from the industry to listen to you, because now the academic staff will have sufficient time to know that this is Melissa, and I know her. In her year one, she built that. In her year two, she designed this. In her, in her year three, she did that. And then I will say she's an engineer or an accountant or whatever that might be. So this becomes actually a more, more authentic learning rather than less. And then we need to be able to say, you know what? I don't want to report because most likely this would be written by, by AI. I want yeah. you to stand and defend this design for me and sell it to me and tell me why it's a better design, why it's a safer design, why it's a, it's a more sustainably, sustainable design, an environmentally friendly design, and so on. So then it becomes, we are really building these elements okay. that we have been trying to build for so long, like ability to speak, ability to convince, having self-confidence. So I think that is one vision we could move into, but that requires that we move from the almost all of the traditional assessment. Yeah. I think the real issue here yeah. is we are using traditional assessment and then we are superimposing AI on it and say, how can I do this? How can I still give you to, you know, ask you to write a thesis, but then I check whether you have used <laughs> AI to do it. That's right. Move away from that, you stand, and then the knowledge will be within you. And I totally agree with the, Dr. Melissa about the diminishing of fa faculty. So for example, mm. look at memory. Uh, people my age used to, when I was you know, 10 or 12, I remember probably 100 phone numbers, 100. Now I remember only my current number <laughs> and my house number in 19, you know, 70 oh, that's something. That's true, that's true. The house that you grew up in. Yes, still I still the remember the number, yeah. right? But the, the thing is, this is a memory as a faculty has diminished because we are utilizing our tools to do it. And I think the we need to be very careful that we don't, for example, rely on, 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 on tools alone. So just imagine mm. if we don't have good command of English and all of us use the Google Translate or whatever to translate, because I see sometimes some students who just rely on the technology to, to communicate. But that means they will never be able to 
be communicators on their own. You know, you go to a party and have an engaging conversation, and that's what you know what keep, makes us human. Your vision is compelling. I have to admit. Um, for what um, we want our future university students to, to be able to do the skills that they, they should have. But what would it take for assessments to be disrupted in that way, to be completely overhauled and changed for, for teaching, learning and assessments? Because if one university does it and the rest doesn't, then they're like, this is, sounds too hard for me. I'm going to go to the other university, particularly in the private sector, the private landscape. Um, are, are there... Is, are all universities on board embracing the disruption of AI? What makes different universities approach it differently? Dr. Melissa. I can only speak for Sunway University. At Sunway University, we have um, constituted uh, guidelines for students, academics, and even the admin staff to follow. And we are in the plan to come up with framework and and, and, and initiatives to ensure that um, these will then translate into different pockets of projects. And these will definitely look, one of the projects will definitely look into how we can redesign our syllabus. I think it is important for us to embrace this. We can't, you know, push this away. It is yeah. inevitable because when it comes to technology, you know, it is always evolving. And every now and then, you are faced with these disruptive tools. And the, the thing about you know, disruption, the way you, how, the way you manage you know, this disruptive behavior is the most utmost importance, mm -hmm. rather than putting a stop and trying to be so in denial. Yeah, or fearful of it. Yes, you know, fearful approaching of it, it. Approaching it in a way that's maybe more conservative yes. or more kind of wait and see. Mm. I, I know that there are companies, there are universities, organizations who say, well, we've been doing this th this way for years, hundreds yes. of years even. We're not going to kind of, ch it, it will shake the mm. integrity of That's academia, right? Yeah. right? I mean, it, it shakes it to yes. the core. Uh, Mushta, do you, what do you think will happen if some universities race ahead to adopt AI and others don't? So let me tell you one thing. First of all, I think this is happening whether universities like it. <laughs> <Okay>. Yes. <laughs> I, I can almost see it. Right. right, because you just imagine if you keep on trying to keep the old premise of assessment, right. reports and theses and, and stuff like that, even actually the exam with the technology now is going to be very difficult to, mm. to control the, so the, the, uh, the, uh, the plagiarism. So it will be always a cat and mouse, right? Mm. So the best way is to move on. So that's one, one element. The second element, I speak to employers Dr. Melissa speak to employers, and, and when I speak to employers, none of them told me, Mushta, could you please teach your, your students a bit more math and a bit more physics? And <laughs> the, you ask any employer in the world, what skills do you want in the graduates? And they will tell you, communication, self-confidence, empathy, working with people, and so on. We call these things the 21st century, century skills. skills. You know mm -hmm. what? I'm from the 20th century. <laughs> they were the same skills we were looking for <laughs> back you know, a century change. ago. It doesn't, it doesn't change. change. Okay. And I think what's happening here is we are focusing, because we needed to focus on building the knowledge, and we sort of ig not ignored or left that part mm. aside. Now, these are skills that are so that are very difficult to teach, they're very difficult to learn, and they're very difficult to assess. And I think maybe the AI is our opportunity to to, to actually have a real attempt at doing something with these, with these skills. Now, the AI will create content, mm. knowledge and, and all of that. But when I speak to people who have children and I say, when your kids are online, are they learning nuclear physics? And uh, <laughs> they're not. They are actually do, doing computer games. So, <laughs> so what needs to happen so that our young people go and learn you know, without even the need for uh, an academic to chase them or give them an assignment or, mm. or the threat of an exam. I think you need motivation. So let me tell you about something that we've started. Just give me a yeah, minute. Yeah, sure, yeah? sure. So at, at Harriet Watt University, we started this probably six years ago, where we focused on um, helping our students find their sense of purpose. So every one of our students and every one of our staff, they will spend the first couple of weeks of their journey with the university 
to articulate their impact statement, which has what is their superpower, what is their purpose, and how will they mobilize that purpose into a positive impact on the world. You can't use chat GPT for that, right? <laughs> well, you can, to pro you can produce but something it, but beautiful, it has but to it's come, nothing. It has to come Absolutely. from within. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, let, me, let me give you an example, if you would indulge me. We run probably one of the world's best actuarial science programs. Very high entry, very smart kids. I ask them when they join, why are you doing this? They will say, well, I love math. And my mother said, if you, if you <laughs> become an actuary, you can make a lot of money. Now, after they, we put them into through, the, through this program, let me read you a real impact statement of a real 18-year-old student. It reads like this. I am a math lover. My purpose is to use my mastery for math to reduce complexity for others when they need it the most. I am an actuary. I don't know about you, but I have chilled down my spine every time I read it because finally this young person has figured out why he is doing this. And I think that would be something that would motivate him. Mm -hmm. And I think this bit of finding our sense of purpose will be the biggest contribution that AI has given us. Because now we will have first the space to discover who we are and mm -hmm. focus on it. And secondly, the urge because you can't just get a job based on the knowledge you have. You have to be very, very different. I will make a prediction. In five to 10 years from today, People will go to universities and schools primarily to find about themselves and learn what makes them special and different, and secondarily to learn about a body of knowledge that is accounting or engineering or psychology. That, that's a, a future, say, say that li lies in our future, Dr. Melissa, that requires even the faculty, even um, academics themselves to pivot, to adapt, to evolve. Um, it, you, you mentioned a uh, you know, thinking up a new syllabus, adapting the syllabus, but pedagogical methods must also change. You can't just rely on the same old teaching methods, right? Definitely. How do you view that? Um, building capacity within the faculty, within the administrators themselves, to adapt to, you know, children, graduate students who are embracing AI wholeheartedly? I think we are on the verge of not just trying to understand and trying to educate you know, ourselves about all these different AI tools. We are on the verge of making sure that this is the correct tool for the class, mm. for the kind of approach and delivery that you want to have within your classroom. Um, therefore, in terms of the support system within, you know, a U university, university, for example, has to first come. For example, training, workshop, webinars, uh, not just that they create awareness, then it would then channel and translate into the kind of uh, implementation. And at this point, when implementation, definitely there are a lot of experiment, and implementation would then go into the integration within the classroom. And not only that we create this community of awareness, we, we need to support you know, um, from the end-to-end -end process yeah, to yeah, ensure that it will then be... There needs to be buy-in and support, yes. investment into this, right? This, yeah. is, this has to be continuous. It can't be one-off. Like, for example, I can't just, you know, ask my staff to go and attend a workshop and that's it. It has to come, you know, within um, an implementation, integration, and, you know, perhaps, I do not want to use this word, KPI. <laughs> because that's, that's one of the way, best ways for us to push for something to be done. Mm. And um, I think I did mention about the support system and um, having, let's say, for example, um, you know, someone who is more senior within, you know, the, the department or the university to mentor mm. uh, all these new young academic staff, administrator, I think it's a good practice. And, you know, within these good practices, you know, we can create this you know, community which would then, you know, prosper and they're not afraid. Yeah. 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 They're not fearful of this disruptive technology, um, you know, like AI. And God knows in the future what else will yeah. come our way. Uh, definitely. Well, you know, your enthusiasm, both of you, is infectious. And just based on the way you're approaching this, I'm encouraged and optimistic to see how universities change, how the landscape change 
changes to adapt to AI. But unfortunately, we've run out of time. We could talk about this for another hour or Absolutely, two, I'm yeah. sure. Mm -hmm. But thank you both for sharing Most your welcome. insights. I think that, that there's more to talk when there's more to come. So thank you both for being on the show with me tonight. I appreciate your time. Thank you. That's all we have for you on this episode of Consider This. I'm Melissa Idris, signing off for the evening. Thank you so much for watching. Good night.